when nature, in the forging of continent and ocean, severed our islands from the rest of Europe and poured into the rift a sleeve of ocean, the first page of our history was written. Secure behind this moat, our cliffs of chalk gleaming palely down the centuries, we have remained an island people. From that day to this, every invader or fortune seeker, trader or holiday maker has had to bridge this gap. Some hardy people swim it, others fly it. But for most of us, the usual method is, and always has been, to take a boat. Nearly everyone is familiar with the sturdy cross-channel steamers which daily link our south coast ports with those of Europe. But not so many know the channel ferries, the link spans directly joining the roads and railways of Britain with those of France and all the continent. Come any morning to Dover Harbour at 8 o'clock and you will see the lines of cars mustering at the ferry terminal, luggage racks loaded, bonnets gleaming, engines already beginning to throb to a livelier continental beat. Some for pleasure, some for business. For Paris or Vienna, Venice or Madrid, they all must first pass through the examination hall. Passports and papers are quickly scrutinized. Engine and chassis numbers checked, and if you haven't got the crown jewels in the boot, your car quickly gets the freedom of the continent from a rubber stamp. For cars, like people, must have their passports. Now it's down the ramp and over the link span and into their floating garage, the SS Lord Warden, pride of the Channel Ferry fleet. She can carry 130 cars and 1,000 passengers on a single crossing, and coaches, caravans and double-decker buses too if she has to. The passengers watch as the last cars come aboard. The captain comes on deck to take command. The great steel storm gates are folded too, and they're away. Now the passengers test out their sea legs, nosing about the ship like puppies in a new kennel. They jockey for the best positions, out of the wind and in the sun, and fill their lungs with bracing sea breezes. William Caxton once advised pilgrims to choose a place as nigh the middies of the ship as ye may for there is least rolling or tumbling about to keep your brain and stomach in temper. Green ginger, almonds, figs and rice shall do you great ease by the way. But today's travelers, more foolhardy or more fortunate than Caxton's pilgrims, prefer to refresh themselves duty-free at the smoke room bar. While a step away down the corridor, Motor club officials are at hand to help novices with the mysteries of triptych and carne, of liters per gallon and pounds per kilo, and please remember, drive on the right. mid-morning, the Lord Warden is in mid-channel, heading for Boulogne at a smart 21 knots. 80 miles to the east, at Zeebrugge, a different kind of ferry is being got ready. 
the freight train ferry for Harwich. To a Flemish marshalling yard have come exotic fruits from sunny Mediterranean climes. Yesterday they ripened in the siesta warmth of terraced slopes. Tomorrow they will be unpacked in the din and bustle of a Covent Garden door. The Zeebrugge Harwich Ferry grew out of the improvised rolling stock ferries of the First World War. By using through trucks, constant reloading is avoided and traders can box their goods more lightly. Over the link span connecting shore to ship, the locomotive slowly pushes the wagons into the vast train deck, joining the continent's railways with those of Britain. Something which once, it seemed, could only be achieved by driving a tunnel under the channel. And now to the motorists watching from the decks of the Lord Warden, the coastline of France comes into view. This is always a thrilling moment, however often repeated. In the outer harbour of Boulogne, the ship swings round to approach the dock stern foremost for unloading. May I have your attention, please? Will all drivers, drivers only, please, kindly proceed to their cars? Discharge will commence immediately the vessel is alongside. Past the familiar perspectives of wharfs and jetties, of bomb-torn streets and brave new buildings, Captain and helmsman back the ship snugly into her berth in the inner harbour, an hour and 40 minutes after leaving Dover Quay. into position, the captain gives the signal, the gangway is pushed aboard, and well before the clock has struck midday, the tires of the first cars grip the soil of France. Drivers only leave with the cars. Their passengers disembark by the gangway and join them later at the checkpoint on shore. brief delay for customs and carnet checks, and then they're away into the clattering cobbled streets of Boulogne with all of France before them. And please remember, tenez le droit. All round the clock, the arrival of one ferry seems to trigger off the departure of another. Away at Zeebrugge, the Norfolk with her load of freight wagons is just moving off. In the radio room, the wireless officer transmits to Harwich their expected time of arrival. The attendant tug casts off and drops astern. The navigating officer begins to plot their course. Norwest by west to the North Hinder to avoid hidden wrecks and shoals, then in a straight line past the sunk and cork lightships and up the Boyd Channel through the sandbanks that guard the approaches to Harwich.
as the day dies, ship and sea are held for a moment in the hush of sundown, and the cork light ship, with her lonely crew, slips quietly past in the deepening dusk. From London, every night, when you and I are eating supper or sitting spellbound in a palace of entertainment, there slides out from Victoria Station a very special kind of train, the night ferry from London to Paris. There's something about night travel which lends an air of mystery and enchantment to even the most prosaic of people and places. That man in a bowler hat, for instance. He may, for all we know, be carrying secret papers. And the dogged man in a Macintosh, hard on his heels. Is he trying to get them back again? Anyhow, they're both safely through the customs. This young lady must be up long after her bedtime. She finds everything strange and unbelievably exciting, as if this magical train were about to transport them straight into fairyland. Dead on 10 o'clock, the train glides away from the platform in a puff of cigar smoke and a whiff of exotic perfume. Equally at home in London or Paris, completely bilingual, it is the most blasé and sophisticated of trains. At the same time, over at Harwich, a humbler relation is doing a much less glamorous but equally important job pulling the freight wagons and the Interfrigo trucks off the SS Norfolk Ferry and taking them to the marshalling yard. Hunting up and down through the long, blank hours, then jogging off to Bishopsgate at a time when most sensible people are tucked up in bed and sound asleep. It is just before midnight when the freight train leaves Harwich, and at the same time, to the south, the night train from Victoria is approaching Dover Harbour where the SS Hampton Ferry waits to carry her to Dunkirk. The huge link span is lowered into position under the eye of the berthing master and engages, neat and level as a mortise lock, to receive the incoming train. sleeping passengers snug in their bunks, there now begins a muffled orchestration of shunting and securing and jacking up. A strange symphony, half heard, half dreamed, of buffers and chains and hollow echoings.
When the train is in position and everything shipshape, the berthing master gives the signal for the link span to be raised. From the moment of the train's arrival at the dock until the ship sails, it is the berthing master who is in charge. Now he telephones to the control room and gives the order for the pumps to bring the water inside the lock to the same level as in the harbour outside. The whole of this delicate operation is controlled by an electrical panel worthy of a spaceship. When the water levels inside and outside the dock are the same, the sluices are opened and the lock gate is lowered to the bottom of the basin so that the ship can pass over it. And while the prow of the Hampton cuts a scroll of foam through the night waves, with about another hour to go before Dunkirk, the freight train from Zeebrugge via Harwich has arrived in London. Here, customs men check and unseal the wagons, ready for the porters to begin unloading. These are the doldrum hours, when the spirits are low. There aren't many cockney cracks to be heard, unloading the perishing perishables onto a trolley at two o'clock in the morning at Bishopsgate Station EC2. Then, quite suddenly, almost without warning, it is light again. Grey, ashen, drained of colour. But, for good or bad, Another day is here as the lorries drive out of the goods yard bound for Covent Garden Market. The sun-kissed fruits have reached their destination to be weighed and displayed tasted and tested, bargained for and haggled over, sold and resold, and finally to find their way onto the tables and down the throats of a million London families. And over on the north coast of France, the same pale dawn light sees the night ferry from Dover slipping into Dunkirk Harbour. train is drawn off the ship and through the sidings. Sleep that began in England stirs into wakefulness in France as the passengers reach for early morning tea and a cigarette. Now 
they are on the last lap, rushing through the woods and fields of Normandy, bright in the morning sunshine, past waking villages and opening shutters, and on to Paris, where bone-white sacré cœur stands sentinel on Montmartre Hill as the train glides into the station and comes to rest at 9 a.m. precisely. Now it's time to polish up one's French. Hey, Potter, Potter, mes bagages, s'il vous plaît. Il y a 14 pièces. Oh, merci, bien, c'est tout. Non, non, pas encore. Um, uh, Pardonnez-moi. Uh, Voulez-vous me diriger au Folie Bergère? Families are rejoined, friends meet, strangers disperse, as the passengers spill out of the train to go their separate ways. Hey, taxi, taxi, la gare de l'Est, s'il vous plaît. Vite, vite, je suis très pressé. Oh, le poor bois. Combien pour le poor bois? Le poor bois. Soon the taxis are swallowed up in the streets of Paris, and the picture postcards come to life one by one. The Place de l'Opera, and the Madeleine, the Arc de Triomphe and the Champs Elysees, and Paris's own cathedral, Notre Dame. And when our travelers are tired of sightseeing, they may learn to sit and sit like the true boulevardier and let others do the rushing about. Once more, the clock has turned full circle. The Lord Warden sails out again from Dover Harbor, spanning the Channel Seas with another load of cars and passengers, linking the roads of Britain with those of France and Europe. Bon voyage, chers amis. Et bon vacances.